Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Google Plus Hangout, Freelance Photography 101. My name is Glory, and I'm the online community organizer here at Freelancers Union. We're thrilled to have Alex Colosco with us today. I'm going to share a little bit about what Alex does. He's a commercial photographer based out of Atlanta, Georgia, and he's completely self-taught. He specializes in products, food, and landscape photography. He's also the founder of Photogy.com, which is an educational platform that offers online tutorials and workshops to photographers. Thank you for joining us today, Alex. Hi, Glory. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. So thank you so much. So we're going to get started, everyone. Um, the first question, just out of the box, how did you get your start in freelance photography? Well, photography was a hobby for me for, for a long time. and. Um, I came in U.S. as a programmer, as an IT specialist, and we came. I came with my wife in 2001, if I remember correctly. It was exactly the time when uh, that dot-com bubble collapsed. So, first few years was really fun years to survive. We came with $100 with us. That's it. So, wow. <laughs> yeah, and. Uh, I wasn't really thinking about photography that time, but uh, the very first thing, what we bought on our very first credit card in our life, it was quite an unusual thing for you know guy from Soviet Union. Uh, it was a camera. It was Canon uh, Elan 7 uh, film camera, which was like six, seven hundred dollars or so, just crazy amount of money for that time. And uh, I was, like I said, I liking photography uh, and was doing it for as a hobby, but I was always thinking about my own business, about uh, working for myself mm -hmm. and doing something which I really like. And photography, that's uh, what I really like doing. I tried, um, first of course, I tried to shoot um, people, some flowers, uh, some just landscape and stuff like this, but I very soon found uh, that I really like working with quiet subjects meaning still life, mm -hmm. <laughs> still life photography, because I'm introvert and, uh, you know, in, in portraiture and, uh, well, events, uh, you need to communicate a lot in, in real time. <laughs> it's not yeah. online. So, yeah, I started um, learning just myself, doing it uh, in apartment's bedroom, whatever I want, you know, shooting some little things. And uh, in 2006, we registered a business. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's uh, when we start promoting uh, our services as uh, commercial studio photography services. Yeah. That time I still uh, was kind of doing portraiture a little bit. But yeah, this is how it started. And I, in parallel, I was working as a programmer for a long, long, long time. You'll be surprised how long <laughs> when I quit. I actually quit in 2013, sort of January. Wow, well, Everything congratulations. I did was Yes, it was. Thank you. It was all in parallel. I was very uh, cautious as well, you know. Well, that's interesting. Kids, you know? So you're yeah. saying the first thing that you got when you arrived was your camera. For a freelance photographer, what's the first thing you should invest in, or what are the tools that one should start using immediately when they decide I want to become a freelancer? Well, probably camera at least. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> vital. The lens. Yeah, but uh, the very uh, I think I would be much more uh, successful, I would say probably faster to get my success and where I am, if I would know what uh, I'll be doing, what I really like doing. I didn't invest in this and it was one of the, well, I wouldn't say mistakes, but now I know that if I would concentrate on something much uh, more narrower than just trying to do everything mm -hmm. uh, where you know I can get money, uh, if I would be just product photography, still life, jewelry, uh, liquid, all that stuff which I really passion doing. Mm -hmm. uh, if I would know it from the beginning, I would probably would, I would say, penetrate much deeper into that you know business <laughs> because I spend a lot of time doing things which I don't really enjoy, even with photography. So how does one figure out what they are going to do for their specialization? Is it just if you're passionate about it or doing research? Well, uh, I didn't do research. Uh, what I did over time when I started doing this, it was something which I was ready to do without any money, I mean without uh, monetary compensation, something which I would do just for fun. Mm -hmm. Because you see, I had a job, uh, I had my, uh, I was having my paychecks every month, so it was covering my bills, all this stuff. It just wasn't covering my passion. Yeah. And uh, yeah, just follow your passion, find out what you will do uh, 
doubt even if client won't pay you. That's that's really good advice. So, how did you start finding your first few clients? Uh, well, at the time in 2006, um, it was Google actually. The clients uh, found us uh, through the Google search, just mm -hmm. local search, and it was few uh, listings. It, uh, they dead now, but uh, it was like a local website with listing uh, of photographers, so okay. local people can can find uh, local photographers. That's how I got my first clients. We did some uh, CEO search engine, uh, search engine optimization that time, mm -hmm. and it kind of worked well for us uh, in the portfolio. I was trying to do networking because the very first thing uh, I uh, I got you know a suggestion when I was looking online how to find clients. Yeah. It was like, hey, go to any uh, business um, events, kind of where you can do networking. It didn't work for me, unfortunately, because I'm introvert, and uh, I even now feeling really uncomfortable, you know, doing online stuff, even though I do all this. Well, well you look great on the video. <laughs> well, it's you know inside. So that time it was just I was hiding in a corner somewhere on the on those events, just thinking where it will be done, and uh, so I can go home. So it didn't really work. Well. <laughs> but yeah, online, yeah, clients found me, and they said I just searched Atlanta product photographer, Atlanta studio photographer, and they found me. Wow. Well, from there, did you start to build referrals? How was that finding other, um, connecting with other people? Um, well, I do, what I start doing is uh, I start basically social, I start establishing uh, social media presence, if mm -hmm. you want, right? Um, it started, everything started from my blog when uh, I was, again, because it was my passion, I was start sharing what I was learning while doing assignments, yeah. self-assignments, it, it doesn't matter. I was just uh, recording the lighting setups, you know, putting some tips, and this is how other photographers start finding me, and this is how I gain some popularity. And um, again, I was one of the first who started doing this in that niche because nobody was sharing anything about jewelry photography, about product photography. Uh, you know, whole internet was about uh, weddings, portraiture. You know, you can find a lot of technical details how to do this but not about this, and somehow I didn't, didn't even realize it at the time, but uh, I was one of the first, or maybe I'm first, I don't know. Uh, so, and when, when you start gaining some uh, influence, when you start gaining um, popularity on photographers' community, yeah. that's how you start getting leads from those photographers. Uh, not like every, I mean, maybe not often, but people can recommend other photographers, if uh, let's say it's local photographer for the client, uh, but uh, you, you know, like in, inside community, it's it's very uh, well, it's a good thing to do. Yeah, so community is very important for you. Say it again. Building a community is very important for yes, you. Yes, yes, yeah. it was very important, and uh, I still believe that uh, now it's even more important than six, seven years ago because yeah. the time. Uh, again, we invested some time uh, on uh, search engine optimization and finding those tricks uh, how to, you know, work with uh, Google behind the thing, you know, to, to get some search leads, uh, and, uh, to get better ranking and stuff mm -hmm. like this. And it was working well at the time because I think Google uh, algorithm, Google search was not really clever, but now it's you need to be real. I mean, you, you can't fake anything. You can't really do any kind of the ways or you know some yeah. that's crazy stuff. And only social social media, the real presence uh, is what helps. So, okay. Facebook, Google Plus, Twitter, LinkedIn, especially LinkedIn because it's all uh, business based. Mm -hmm. It's great sources for photographer to to invest oh. time. That's great. So once you have your blog, you have a few clients. What's next? How do you set prices and start to negotiate with your clients? Uh, well, prices was another big deal, <laughs> I would say, because um, again, I wasn't a good networker, and all our friends uh, were either programmers or well, non-businessmen. So I didn't really know uh, any photographer, mm -hmm. so I didn't have a source just to ask, hey, how much you charge for that stuff? And I was shy to ask it uh, online on the forums. So it was just trial and error method. Uh, we were looking for local photographers, and uh, we, were trying, we were trying to figure out their prices, and somehow at least get a feeling how much they charge. And of course, the difference was huge 
from photographer to photographer. But what I was trying to do every time client was approaching me, uh, of course, we've been sending questions uh, about the assignment, just trying to figure out what, what needs to be done. And one of the questions was, uh, what is your budget? What is yeah. your budget for this project? Of course, many uh, responses was it's to be determined, so mm -hmm. one flat. But uh, I was lucky; several few clients gave me their budget, and it was quite different. One guy had like hundred dollars for a day shoot, and another one had uh, three hundred dollars for just one item, uh, which can be done in one hour. So I was like, whoa! And then I start uh, kind of building my pricing based on trying to fit into clients' budget. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, it was interesting because I wasn't really depending from those clients. I mean, my survival, because I wasn't paid check all the time. I had quite flexible schedule on a daily job. So I was working from home and kind of was, you know, when, when, I, when you have passion, you always will find the way to, to kind of pursue it. So it was not a big deal for me. But what, what it led me to do is... Uh, not to fall into, you know, not to pick up assignments, not pick up clients, which uh, I, I feel that uh, it may be like robbing me, you know. Yeah. To... So I was keeping my price, and uh, by time I learned how much it cost, how much I can invest time. Uh, sometimes I was, I was doing things even for free. Again, I can afford it myself, and it worked really well. Uh, building that network because if uh, you can do something for clients, let's say some startup, mm -hmm. uh, they start in something, they, they really don't have any budget, as I saying like, oh, we have $50 for this, and I saying, hey guys, okay, let's do this and that, uh, you publish it somewhere, uh, just mention my name and, uh, you know, things like this, so I can do for free, because I was not dependent from, from those clients, from those leads, I can yeah. do my own. And then we learned about... Um, uh, licensing. Yeah, can you touch? Can you tell us a little bit about how you started in licensing and what a freelance photographer should be mindful of? Uh, well, there are many uh, even books and online sources about how to license. Basically, uh, it's it's like this: more usage costs more money. I mean, if clients are gonna use that image, are uh, in larger distribution or in a larger area, it should cost more even if the uh, job is, I mean, the amount of, of work you need to put is the same. Mm -hmm. So um, the real numbers may be different, but I was doing uh, pretty simple calculations. Let's say um, at some point I set my hourly rate of shooting, let's say $100 per hour. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's without any licensing. And when you license, you, you sell not the image, not your work, but you sell the the rights to use that image, right? You send the rights uh, to the client to use that image. And uh, let's say if they're going to use it in very small amount of publications only in your state, uh, let's say 200% on top of this. So you multiply by two and then it's like 300 per hour of your work. If uh, exactly the same work, uh, they need to license it to nationwide, 500% then on top of your creative fee. We call it creative fee, I think. I, again, terms, I'm not sure because I was kind of learning it myself, so I'm not sure how to name it right. Mm -hmm. But basically, uh, license is what uh, the multiplier for your creative fee. Okay. Right? Well, how about when it comes to keeping the photo projects on track? So you have all these things happening. Maybe you have two clients, two small jobs, two large jobs. How do you streamline your everything when you're doing jobs? Uh, well, I'm not really an organized person. I <laughs> so uh, the, the best thing uh, I could do is to communicate with client to make sure that uh, we're doing uh, what they expect us to do. Make sure that there is no changes on their side. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, also no assumptions, uh, and if anything gets different than uh, we put our estimate or, uh, well, during their work on the project is something different, uh, I learned that immediately I need to get back to the client, and uh, before it gets too um, too far, you know, to change anything. Uh, so I didn't have time when, uh, well, maybe it was just a few times when 
I had um, several projects simultaneously, several large projects running, so I kind of need to jump here and there. Yeah. No, uh, because again, I was doing only things which I really like to do. I was losing a lot of clients, even at the beginning. Well, no, maybe not a lot, but I, I didn't uh, jump on every... Uh, you were really day. selective. Yes, because I knew that I need to be... I need to keep doing what I really like to not to kill the passion. Because what the reason is to, you know, dreaming about something, uh, dreaming to uh, leave your daily job and doing something which you love, and then appearing in the situation the same as without, but without a uh, paycheck, but you'll be doing what you, what some boring stuff every day, but call it photography. In this case, you'll be, again, dreaming about something else. It may just kill it. So I was kind of aware about it and uh, was always trying to, to do what I really like. That's great. So as you continue your freelance career, I, I love your site that, that, that offers education to fellow freelancers and photographers. Um, how do you in continue to stay inspired in this line of work? What keeps you motivated? Well, education, educational business, I would say, or helping other photographers is uh, much more, uh, it drives me much more than shooting, working for the client. Mm -hmm. And I kind of found that it was a big shift uh, in uh, my whole um, whole path or my whole way when I kind of start feeling this, that working for one client, even if it's really good uh, assignment and really good client, uh, doesn't give me that kind of emotional feedback as if I would do some educational project, basically the same shot, but uh, with uh, tutorial, with lesson, with explanation, with all this stuff, and then uh, see how that thing helps other photographers to become more successful, to, to get uh, clients to get real cool shots. It's just, well, it's an amazing feeling. So um, about two years ago, I started shifting from working for clients by working for education for my project. For well, it's, Now it's our project, it's a big community, uh, 40G.com. And uh, well, inspiration, it's everywhere. We have uh, if we have this Facebook group uh, 40G, and if you just look at what people post in there, what photographers post in, uh, the shots are amazing, and we, we always share how it's kind of one of the rules. We always share how we did the shot, so the lighting setup, some explanation, and anyone can uh, ask uh, author, the photographer, additional questions. And I don't know, I have very. Um, it's a kind of engineering mind. I, I really want to dig into these details. So when I see something, new ideas start popping up in my head. How would do it differently on different subjects? But you know, it's it's everywhere. Inspiration. Uh -huh. If you're doing what you love. Simple. <laughs> so how about the horror stories? I know it's great to have amazing things happen, but I'm sure you have some horror stories too. Can you tell us some things maybe clients have done and how you've been able to overcome that obstacle? <laughs> uh, yeah, horror stories. That's we. Most of the horror stories came from uh, mis miscommunication with a client. So uh, one thing was. Um, Miscommunication or uh, lack of experience at some point. Uh, I remember we got uh, this client, um, really good, very big uh, jewelry job, mm -hmm. shooting nice jewelry, and um, we kind of we, we've seen the products on on little images. I mean the jewelry pieces. We know how much, uh, how many pieces to be done, and we kind of did uh, the estimate. We did everything, and we start shooting it. But once I got things in the studio. First time when I've seen the actual items, it was the first day of shooting day. And it was a big mistake because it was so uh, dirty, so worn jewelry. Very expensive though. But I just found that there is no way we can fit. Uh, it, was, it, it was affecting a uh, retouching job. But what we did, the estimate, no way we can fit in that time. Because we just had no idea how bad uh, the actual items are. And, um, well, the lesson was that I need to see 
if I have any doubt, especially with Julie, you can actually judge the condition by iPhone shot, which clients mm -hmm. can send you. Uh, you need to really see the item, or at least talk, make sure that it's new, for example, brand new, no scratches, uh, and stuff like this, because that time, we've been doing much more retouching job than uh, we are thinking, and uh, we're doing, we are doing it much longer. Mm -hmm. So both sides uh, felt that uh, something is, is not right. Mm -hmm. We, we kind of we did more than uh, we get compensated for, and client uh, got a little bit, well, it was not a big deal, uh, I mean, big delay, but still, we need to hire uh, another retoucher. So it was quite um, experience, learning experience. I would <laughs> say. Well, in, in, in uh, landscaping, I was doing architecture shots um, uh, for a uh, large uh, apartment building and renovating, and uh, it was a shot in Florida. They did some luxury apartment homes, which should be done in, in inside and out. I mean the images. So I flew there without looking at uh, weather conditions. Oh no! And just found that it's rainy. Oh. And it was yeah, it, stupid. You know that kind of thing. It's so easy to but. So we we ended up I, I was ended up shooting under the rain and we did huge fun in Photoshop you know putting that nice skies and other stuff uh, mm -hmm. I mean because the client should that kind of apartment it should be done on perfect weather conditions uh, so always well you need to always watch for conditions if it's outside <laughs> that's why I uh, like studio shots I control everything here there is no mm -hmm. rain there is <laughs> <laughs> just uh, so. Well, you bring up retouching. Are there any tools that a, a photographer needs? You know, there's Photoshop, there's Lightbox. Like, what would you recommend that they have in their toolkit when it comes to retouching or editing uh, in general? Uh, Photoshop is the giant. I mean, we always use Photoshop uh, the retouching. Uh, I use uh, Capture One uh, as my um, tethered solution because in studio I always shoot tethered, and I used to use uh, Lightroom. Great for tethering, uh, but once I uh, shifted to medium format cameras, Lightroom uh, doesn't really work well. Well, I think it doesn't work at all with medium format, so I switched to Capture One, and it's really good. It's, it's, it has some really cool features, uh, but it's for tethering. For retouching Photoshop, uh, we have, it's, again, it's not me who's doing this. Uh, my wife, uh, she's co-owner of the business, and she's our retoucher. She's our Photoshop guru. She's, she knows it much better. But I know, uh, for example, one of the plugins which helps us a lot is to pass the noise. Okay. It's basically, plugin for uh, reducing noise on uh, you know noisy photos. Uh, but we use it uh, a little bit different because because there is no noise in studio. I shoot that I saw 100 or 50. Uh, but uh, it can be used to polish um, glossy metal or anything glossy mm -hmm. to kind of polish it in Photoshop, and uh, it's it's really great. Using the the noise uh, to pass the noise tool. So and also um, color effects for landscaping. Now um, Google bought it. I forgot the name uh, of uh, the whole plugin family, but I uh, especially like uh, color effects. Oh, that's great. Well, another tool that freelancers often need. Are to be aware of our contracts. Do you have any advice about when it comes to writing your contracts? Uh, well, just make sure to uh, to put everything, uh, all possible conditions uh, into a contract because again it may lead to some, if it's misunderstanding uh, at the end, uh, especially on the contract, it's not a good thing. Again, one uh, horror story <laughs> from this. Uh, we had a client, uh, very interesting, large client, we were shooting beverages. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were negotiating, uh, negotiating everything, and uh, I was, as usual, was concentrating on how to shoot, what uh, to deliver, what kind of picture and what they want. And we kind of went really well into this, and uh, we signed contract. Uh, all was good. We got many cases of that beverage. Uh, it was pure fun shooting it. And uh, then post-production, all was cool. And uh, when we delivered the image, it appeared that uh, there is much shorter deadline. And they need not just 
TIF image, because before that, just a long time ago, but before that we were just delivering always a uh, TIF image, uh, you know, um, uh, 8 bit or 16 bit, uh, and the client uh, doing all the preparation for printing uh, themselves. And mm -hmm. this time they were expecting us to deliver a ready to print, you know, the different color space, SMYK, I mean, the, um, the file ready for printing. And that it was like what? And when we just simply convert something, it didn't work because of the gradients. Uh, we just found a huge piece of um, knowledge which we didn't have the time. Yeah. How to prepare for printing, and uh, it's not just you know converting the uh, uh, the color space. As, wow. You know. So knowing yeah. the scope of the project is really really important. Yeah. So and it was like boom, guys, and we need to again uh, search for somebody who can do it for us in one day, and it was just really overwhelming. So again, uh, it, it should be in contract what uh, final uh, kind of condition in delivering the image, what for print or just, uh, you know, sizes, everything, DPI, you know, you never know when it will misalign of what client was thinking about and you were thinking about, because it's two different minds, right? Yeah. And you connect in, when you connect two different minds, uh, same word, can mean different things, you know? Yeah, completely. <laughs> okay, that's, that's great information, Alex. Thank you. I have one more question for you. Um, how do you keep your clients? And how important is follow-up in your process? Well, I didn't do any follow-ups. I didn't try to keep my clients. Really. That's, that's my thing. Uh, I, for example, when we were doing uh, quotes for clients, I know that probably nobody is doing this, but uh, I never follow up if a um, client didn't get back to me uh, after receiving my initial quote. For me, it's just a sign that uh, they don't really looking for me, they're just looking for least expensive photographer in, in the area or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's not the way I want to work. I, w I was putting so much uh, energy of building you know, my style uh, that I want the client to work to want to work with me. So it was many cases when uh, the budget, which we didn't know when we do one quote, was way 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 different. Uh, in, I mean lower than the quote. But if clients really want to work with me, they always are uh, getting back and uh, kind of trying to negotiate it. So that was a big sign for me. Okay, they want to work with me, and uh, we can do something. Uh, so. I didn't follow up uh, after, oh well, if we think about uh, after the assignment, of course I need to make sure that everything is fine and uh, there is just simple email or some, communic some communication uh, just to make sure that they're all happy, uh, we're all, we all good. And uh, I don't do any, you know, like postcards or anything, really, I, I don't know. So you stick to email, and after the project is done, you'll send like a wrap-up email. Yeah, yeah, I, every, everything is done. Uh, I'm just uh, sending an email saying thank you, and um, just if anything pop-ups, let me know. So something like this. Pretty simple. Well, maybe at some case, I mean, at some point it's probably follow-up, right? That's what you call follow-up. <laughs> yeah, it, it sounds like a very oh. effective method to, to okay. reach back out. Sounds great. Um, and we're going to take one or two questions just from our Google Plus audience. It says here, um, it looks like people are concerned about protecting their photos. How do people protect their pictures from getting stolen or um, when it comes to protecting them with copyright? Can you offer some feedback about that? Uh, yeah, sure. Well, I'm, I'm not looking at this as protecting images. I use my images as my advertisement agents, I would say. Uh, I don't really try to protect them. Yeah, I have a little watermark at the corner, but it's mm -hmm. not protection, it's really easy to cut it off if you want to steal, it's not a problem. It's more if uh, somebody wants to find me, find the photographer, yeah. they have this ability. But protection, I don't think you need to try to protect it. Uh, much more, it, it, take, it will take energy and uh, it's still hard to track, uh, yeah. track uh, who's, I mean, where is it was stolen, where. Much more, uh, much better solution at least it worked for me, is to invest in your brand, invest in your style. 
And if somebody will steal the image, you'll be notified because people will recognize your image. And I'm getting like every week I'm getting email from fellow photographers saying, hey, here's your image. And usually it's just other photographer using in portfolio or on Facebook or something like this, something very simple. And again, I can use it uh, just to boost popularity. I can do some little buzz. Hey, you see, that's funny. My image is there, kind of cool. Uh, I'm glad I'm popular. You know, at the end, I'm getting more visibility. I'm getting more, uh, uh, well, people know more that, that this is my images. It, it works for me every time I'm stealing. stealing. And uh, if some serious business will steal your image, again, just make sure that people will recognize that it's yours. So you will know, somehow you'll get notified. And then it's probably time for a lawyer, right? Uh, and you can get some pretty good compensation if it's uh, some serious business stole it, not like just some photographer from third country, you know? So, so. that watermark sounds pretty important. Yeah, a little watermark, I think it's good. It's, it's good. Uh, but the idea is to make photos recognizable, not by watermark, but by your style. You know, it's interesting. Sometimes uh, people say, hey, Alex, is it your photo? And uh, there is a photo, not mine, but it's liquid. It's kind of splashy. It's, it reminds probably photographer uh, look at uh, some of my tutorials and did something similar. And people thinking that it's mine. You know, it's kind of a little bit probably too much, but this is the best protection I'm in, in terms of uh, just make it recognizable. Think about uh, this. And, well, there is good thing about copyright. Uh, you can really uh, file the copyright, um, well, you can protect by filing your know, images into copyright office, US copyright, I think it's in. That's how it's called. We have a good book, actually. A uh, photographer from San Francisco, Alex Stepano, wrote an e ebook uh, showcasing the whole process of uh, filing the copyright. Uh, it's not a claim, it's basically, um, how you call it? It's filing your images uh, under that uh, copyright office. Oh, it's copyright office, that's how it's called. Okay. So, but I never did it. I never did it uh, for me because uh, I don't think in photography need to spend time to kind of really protecting it. It's better to to share. To share and uh, yes, spend on making have it have a unique style. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I think we're almost done with our our Google Hangout, Alex. Do you have any final words of inspiration to our audience? <sighs> well, I was talking so much about, you know, passion <laughs> and uh, kind of doing uh, your way. So probably I would just repeat that it's very important. Whatever you do, just make sure it aligns with uh, your vision, with your vision, with, with how you see your future as a photographer, as a freelance photographer, as a business owner, anything. Because sometimes it's really hard to find uh, the answer in, in in some situation when you need to choose between here and here and uh, there is not enough uh, basically data to judge uh, the right solution. And for me, uh, it only works with if I have a vision, I set it, I kind of work on trying to imagine what I want to be, how I want to live, what I want to do in 10 years or so. If I have that vision, it's very easy to check anything which is going on right now, is it aligns or not with that vision? And it's the answer for almost any questions which uh, is not obvious, I mean, the answers. You just make sure that, well, so let's put it this way. When you do anything, make sure it aligns with uh, your true passion, with your vision of your future. That sounds yes. perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Thank it you It really so works. Much. Really well. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. It was really great learning about freelance photography. You gave us the full 101. Thank you, Gloria. It was uh, my pleasure. And, uh, well, I hope to talk to you <laughs> sometime <laughs> in the future. Uh, feel free to, well, to anyone who's watching us. I am um, open to, I'm open on Google Plus and Facebook. Uh, post your questions, uh, well, whatever you want. I'll be glad to answer. How, how can people find you on Facebook and on Twitter? Do you want to share your handles with us? Uh, it, on Twitter, it's A. Koloskov, and on Facebook, it's uh, Alex Koloskov. But the best way, probably, if you want direct uh, answer, it's on Fochichi. There is a contact form on uh, sidebar. Uh, I receive all emails from that uh, form. And it's, it's a lot of emails, but 
I read every email. I may not uh, answer because sometimes just some you know uh, troubleshooting organization stuff. So our, our team members helps on this. But if it's something personal, uh, I read and I answer. Perfect. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Glory. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.